Hello, this is Dr. Caitlin Kite from the Academic Development Team, and this session will provide an introduction to multimedia research communication. This builds on previous sessions in this series, so hopefully you do have some familiarity with the basic concepts we've already covered with thinking about how to apply those to your context and with thinking about engagement more generally. So this is now going to move into thinking more specifically about how do you pick the appropriate platform for you and what sorts of things do you need to consider whenever you're doing that. If you are at the point of thinking about platforms yourself, there are a lot of specifics that need to be addressed for each platform. So if you are already thinking that you want to do Twitter and you want to know more specific information about Twitter, for example, you're not gonna find what you want here because this session steps back and thinks about that thought process and that planning process a little bit more generally. It's really hard to provide specific advice unless you're having a one-to-one -one conversation with someone or you've created a dedicated session about each of those different platforms. So that's not what this session will look at, though I will provide some additional resources in case you do want to look into those things later on. Hopefully this is something that will give you more of a framework that you can use to approach that sort of work and those sorts of decisions in the future. So with that said, let's begin. I'll start by asking a question. What makes good research communication? I don't think there is a definitive answer, and so what I would like to know is what makes good research communication for you, in your point of view. And I would ask for you to think about the best research communication that you've ever encountered. And picture that in your mind and think about what was it that made it so effective. And when you're thinking about why this is the best thing, you might be thinking about it because it's fun or it was memorable or it was informative. Whatever it is that you're using to, to make that judgment, that's fine. But pick out three aspects of that trait that made it really effective. And then think further about whether you can adapt that sort of thing, that sort of style, that sort of approach for your own context. Or maybe there are certain parts of it that you could adapt for your own context. And think about what those bits might be, why you can do that, or what barriers there might be, why it's not appropriate for you. And all of that can get you to start thinking about how you can take your own experiences and use that to build on your own personal knowledge when you are doing outreach. So take a moment pause the video and think about that before you move on to the next slide. Since I couldn't get feedback from you right away, I wanted to provide some of the suggestions that people in previous sessions have given, and also some of these are additions that I've made based on my own experience. So here you'll see things that range from how fun and interactive something is to how useful it is and how much people feel that it's relevant and applicable to them in their lives. There are things like humor and the enthusiasm of the presenter, as well as traits like capitalizing on a person's uh, creativity and their sense of wonder and their own personal interests. So really having a connection with the audience. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, it's probably just the tip of the iceberg, but I think you can see here from looking at what people have reported that there are many different types of things that they have found useful and interesting and memorable in the sorts of projects that they experienced. And when I ask people to talk about in more detail the actual uh, events or resources that they had in mind as they were thinking of these traits, there was quite a range. Some of them were museum exhibits, some of them were one-to-one -one teaching opportunities and, and mentoring with people, some of them were books that they read, so there's quite a range of formats. And I think across those formats and across these different sorts of, of projects and, and traits and encounters, what really ties all of them together and unifies them is that the people who design those things will have taken the, the time to really think about their audience and to think about their context and to think about what their goals were so that they could make really good decisions about how they were going to present their material, where they were going to do it, what format it was going to take. And that's not the only thing that will have happened here, but I do think that that step is really critical because that is what is creating that learning environment and that experiential environment that's being so successful. So that's why I think it's important 
to now spend a little bit of time thinking about your medium so that you know which medium or which media is appropriate for you so that you can achieve these sorts of things. Now, I think one of the tricky things with doing research communication these days is that we have so many different options of medium. And I use the term multimedia to shorthand really across all of these things because it's just hard to predict what someone will think of, especially because often we find that people aren't just sticking to one thing, that in fact they're taking lots of different media and putting them together in a single project, or they will create a project in one place and then distribute it in many others as well. So in this selection process, you're really having to filter through quite a lot of different things and think about what is useful for you, what's comfortable for you, what's appropriate for your audience, and so on. I would say that this list here more or less summarizes all of the different options that are out there. So there are the obvious things like writing. Uh, you might have a book or a blog or a magazine article, for example. There are things like videos, which you might have on YouTube or even on TikTok or Instagram. And then you might also share those via social media elsewhere, like Twitter or Facebook. There are still images. And I think we often overlook this, but there are a lot of uh, photography competitions out there for research images. There are infographics that are quite important. You can submit these things to uh, journals and to databases and to magazines. So I think the still images themselves are also quite important. There's audio, which might be podcasting. It might be uh, really nerdy science music. There are actually people who have careers singing really nerdy science music that's entertaining. There's performance, so there is a lot that you can do with drama, and people are uh, in increasingly looking at how you can take scripts and put a lot of scientific information in those scripts in order to um, convey something through drama, through nonfiction or fictional performances, in order to really get the emotions of the audience involved while also teaching them. You can create Artifacts, we see this a lot these days with 3D work, for example, but you can also find other sorts of artifacts. Uh, a really great project that I'm aware of is one about um, coral reefs, and it's done by the Institute of Figuring. So it's all about the math that is around the patterns that they use to crochet and to knit coral reefs out of yarn, but then all of that is used in order to have conservation impacts. So you can have artifacts made of all sorts of materials. Objects would fall in this as well. Um, so artifacts and objects kind of cross that line where basically you're thinking of something that is 3D uh, versus something that's 2D. Can it be picked up and handled? Is it just going to be looked at? But these two different things kind of uh, fill that same niche in many ways. You might also think about things like methodologies and instructions. So a lot of how-to lists or a bullet point of the key things you need to consider, a checklist, these are actually really useful as well. And you often don't think of that sort of thing as being research communication, and yet, depending on your context, that might be. And of course, you can have things that arise from any combination of the above. So things like games and apps and web pages and social media, all of those are often drawing on multiple of these things and combining them so that you can have uh, one product that takes in lots of different media. Or you might find, as I said earlier, that it's created in one and disseminated elsewhere. But the point is that there are lots of different choices out there. And if one thing is not of use for particular audience or it's not of use because you're not good at it, you have lots of other options. But you do have to really be thinking about which is going to be most appropriate for a given project. As you are undertaking that thought process and you're planning, you have to really think about how each channel is going to impact your efficacy or your potential efficacy. And these are some of the concerns that I think you really need to consider here. So who is your message going to be accessible to and also appealing to? So for example, if you are trying to reach 
uh, perhaps a, an older audience or an audience that's in a more rural location, it may be that social media, for example, is not something that they do very often. It's not a habit for them. It's not a big part of their lives. Or perhaps it would be, but they can't get connected very well. So you don't want to be sinking all of your eggs into one basket of social media if that's not actually going to reach the people uh, that you are trying to talk to. You need to think about what aspects of a topic you want to emphasize. So if you have something that's highly visual, you probably don't want to just stick to a podcast because how are people going to be able to see the things you're talking about? Or vice versa, if you've got something that has lots of sounds, why would you just uh, have a blog post, for example, that's just words? So think about what can you capitalize on that's inherent in the work that you're doing. You also want to be thinking about how much information you need to get out there and you need to include and, and what will that information look like. So if you need to provide lots and lots of details and you want to have lots of files that people might need to download and fill in or that they could make use of, you probably don't want to have a YouTube video. You want to give them a platform where they can actually go through all of that information and have it there to, to reference. They can download those things and it's just going to be a much easier and more efficient process. And then of course for your own sake you want to be thinking about how easy is it going to be to get this out there and how are you going to make people aware of it. So if you have got um, a 3D printed object, for example, to, to demonstrate perhaps a new device that you want to make and that you want to distribute, that's fantastic if you've actually got access to people and they can see it and play with it and understand it. But if you're at a distance, if you don't even know who your audience are yet, if you haven't made contact with them, how are you going to get that in front of them so that they can interact with it? You need to have a plan for that and think about what works. And does it need multiple stages so that you make the contact and then you set up a meeting and then you get people in a room and then you can bring out the object, for example. So all of this might require multiple levels and multiple stages of thinking and you don't want to just lose sight of that because you're focusing only on a particular platform of interest or a particular endpoint and not everything that's needed to get you there. In order to do that effectively, I think that you need to have uh, what I refer to as an intro to marketing and an intro to comms that will underpin the thinking that you do. So I'd like to run through just a few ideas for each of those and then also show you an example of what I mean by that and how that might work in the real world. So when you're thinking about the marketing aspects of things, I would suggest you need to start off by understanding what your product is, what your niche is, and what your brand is. And I know that all of this sounds really corporate, and that might kind of put you off, but there's a reason that people in marketing do these things, and that's because it is actually quite effective and very useful. And you don't have to have a business degree to uh, employ, uh, to apply these concepts, but it, it is helpful just to get a quick introduction to them. So I would suggest that your product is, in this context anyway, the knowledge that you have. If you are a researcher wanting to do research communication, then your product is that knowledge that you've got that no one else has. It's your area of expertise, and that is what you are going to somehow translate and offer to the world. So for example, let's just say that in this case, and I've just chosen a, a random thing here that hopefully will portray this and you guys will um, kind of relate to it enough that it will make sense. Let's say that your area of expertise, your product, is information about flood mitigation techniques. Now, that is fairly broad. There are a whole lot of flood mitigation techniques, there's a whole lot of information, and there's information about many different aspects of those techniques. So that's not really narrowing down your focus too much. And that's where the concept of niche comes in. So your niche is what allows you to start thinking about um, the, the subset of the market, if you like, on which your specific product is focused. So if your product is satisfying a particular want or need, the niche is really thinking about um, how specialized that want or need is and, and who has that and who is it that you're going to be helping with this. So in this case, I would say that one niche of many that you could select here is that rather than just information generally about flood mitigation generally, you might focus in on facts about flood mitigation in farmland. 
so there you can say that um, you can see that what you've done is think about specifically out of all that different information what type are you going to do and in, in what uh, geographical area and that starts to refine your focus a bit your brand then would be the flavor of all of that so the the format if you like the style uh, the voice that you're using all of those things that distinguish your product from other products and the reason that I say you also need to think about who is you is that perhaps it's not you personally it might be your lab group it might be you and your collaborators on a particular project it might even be an organization or your institution that's doing this and you might just be contributing to that but you need to know that ahead of time so you know what voice to be using and what personality to be projecting in that so in this case, again, you can see that I've suggested it one way of further narrowing your niche and, and understanding kind of the flavor of that is to create a lab-wide effort. So this is you and all of your collaborators there working on the same topic that provides updates on the latest advances in flood mitigation tactics and in, in farmland, which is implied here. So the idea here is that the voice would be a bunch of different experts working together, which does spread the load nicely. The facts are going to be specifically the latest advances. So what you might do, for example, is scour the literature and see what's coming out each week and then have a summary of, of the latest steps or the latest um, progress that's being made and then you already know that your topic is this flood mitigation. So that allows you to just start off really big with your product and move smaller. And I think that this does need to happen alongside thinking about the comms because comms and marketing are really closely related as we've talked about uh, previously in these other sessions and we'll get onto here in a moment you do have to be aware of your audience because that might help you refine as you're moving through this set of questions but I kind of think that you need to start here even if you do quickly start running both processes in parallel because you do need to know what your product is even if it's just a really really general thing if you don't know what expertise you have to offer that no one else has to offer then it's going to be really hard to start thinking about your audience um, and the context and all of that. So I would suggest that if nothing else, that what is your product question is the first one that you need to ask. So at some point, earlier or later, you are going to also start thinking about the comms aspects of things. And here are the three questions that I think are related to that. Who are your audience? How are you going to connect with those people and also access those people? And what are you hoping to achieve as you do that? How are you going to measure your success in the end and know that you've made a difference and that all of this was worth your time? So building on the example from the previous slide, the audience here, again, could be many people. I'm just choosing an example. But let's say that they are non-expert adults. And in particular, you're thinking about farmers. So you have decided from the start that although there are lots of people out there, the folks that you really want to reach are farmers who have experience in action, even though they don't have the academic experience and that firsthand access to um, the journal articles that we were talking about on the previous slide. So you want to be able to give to them something that they don't have access to because they aren't uh, able to get through the paywalls or they aren't able to keep up to date with that because they're busy doing other stuff. Then you have to think, right, if, if these are people who are in rural areas, they are hard at work all day, they're probably not spending a lot of time on social media, um, they may be working six days a week or even seven days a week, so they probably aren't spending lots of free time going to museums or um, just strolling about in town, how am I going to encounter them and get them this information? And it may be that the answer to that question, as it is here, is something that's a bit more uh, low-tech and a bit less modern, if you like, because we get really uh, excited about things like 3D printing and anything digital, but sometimes you also need to consider stuff like flyers, newsletters, face-to-face uh, -face conversations, knocking on doors, canvassing, and having one-to-one -one conversations. And of course, there are other options as well. I'm not suggesting that farmers don't have internet connections. Uh, I just chose this example just to highlight the fact that sometimes it is useful to think about 
stuff that you might think is a bit antiquated or is not what everyone else you know is doing because sometimes that is what's more appropriate for you in a given setting. It's also really important to know what you're trying to achieve because that is going to influence what your message is and how you shape that and then how you evaluate at the end whether you actually got to that point. So in this case, one example of a goal might be to prevent irresponsible water use practices, to facilitate empowerment of these people, to change their voting practices, and perhaps even to seek volunteers for a project. And this is clearly a series of different goals, and that is completely fine. You don't have to have just one. But on the other hand, you don't have to have four or five either. It's completely up to you. And it really depends on what you think you can achieve with a given um, project and a given amount of money and time and so on. But if you've got this list of things, you could start to think about how you might then measure them. So if you want to prevent irresponsible water use, you could find out what people are doing now. And then you could engage in your communication and then see what they're doing after. If you want to facilitate empowerment, you might be just having conversations with them, you might be surveying them, or you might be looking to see how that's connected to things like um, do, doing certain types of things more independently. Um, it might be related to that voting practice. It might be related to how often people are willing to take part in projects as volunteers and so on. So you can figure out what metrics are right for you. But the point is that you will want to do something like that so that you can know for sure that you're spending your time wisely and that you're being effective. And if you aren't being effective, then you can change course. On top of those basic things, you'll also want to consider some functional and practical things. And these are the sorts of ideas that we have been talking about throughout the sessions, and so I don't think that they need to be dwelled on too much, but it is worth pointing out and reminding you that you do need to check whether you already have the skills that you need, and if you don't, you can think about where you might learn things like video editing or sound editing or uh, creating a newsletter and distributing over email, whatever it is that you're interested in. It is helpful to think about how much time you have a blog sounds really great until you realize how much time it takes to write each article. And so whereas you might have wanted to write every day or once a week, suddenly you realize it's much more likely that you're going to be writing once a month. Or a social media account sounds fantastic until you understand how much work it takes to build up an audience and then also to respond to all the comments and all the activity that you get once you do have an audience. So all of these things take different amounts of resources and you just need to be aware of that and budget that in and see what's the best fit for you. You'll want to think about intellectual property and whether you're allowed to be talking about things out loud uh, or whether some of that needs to be embargoed for some amount of time. There might also be other legal considerations as well. If you're talking with vulnerable people or if you are discussing ideas that have health implications and so on. So just be aware of the legal context. You may not want to generate revenue, but if you do, you'll want to think about how you might do that and how much you might want. Maybe it's just to keep something self-sustaining or to periodically fund a new piece of equipment to help you keep going. But whatever that is, you'll want to have an idea in advance of how you can go about setting that up. I think it's really important to ensure that the material ages well. You don't want to put a lot of work into something and then realize that you refer to a specific holiday or event or date and then suddenly you can't ever use that um, once you've moved on in time a few months or a few weeks even. So make sure that you can future proof it as much as possible so that you can use it as long as possible and in as many places. And I also think it's worth considering whether there are any drawbacks to exposure. So I've asked groups in the past to list the pros and the cons, and a lot of people are increasingly aware of issues with trolls online, for example, of having people um, doxing you or of being followed by a stalker. And all of these things, I would say, are, are relatively uncommon. It's not likely that you are going to face this. Uh, although if you're a woman or a person of color or someone else who attracts more attention typically online, then that, the, the rate at which that will happen is different. So you just need to be thinking about what are the potential pitfalls? How can I put some things in place to avoid that? Uh, is this something I'm worried about? And, and does it all on balance still 
mean that I do want to go ahead with this or not. And I'm not trying to scare anyone. It's probably not an issue at all. It's just worth thinking about that in advance so that you can plan. Now I'd like to set you a task so that you can put to you some of the things that I've just been discussing, that you've just been thinking about. After this video, you'll find uh, a PDF that lists a few different science communication scenarios. And all of these are drawn from the real world. They're drawn from situations that people like you have faced. So we did ask for people to suggest some of these to us in the past so that we could make these uh, relevant and hopefully useful. So look through those scenarios and find at least one. And if you're interested, you might want to pick a couple more. But find something that seems interesting and relevant to you, something that you think is close to a situation that you might encounter given what your interests are, or is definitely something that you were planning for anyway. So think about then the scenario and think about how you would answer the questions that are posed within it. But while you're doing that, also think, you know, could you pursue a project like this for your, for your own research? What barriers might you need to overcome if you did? And what further development might you need if you were to go forward with that? And that's why I would suggest picking something um, that definitely is interesting and relevant, but maybe also something that seems really unusual. Uh, and that might get you to think a little outside the box about your own work and something new and different that you might be able to, um, to do with that work. So when you are done with that, you can, well, you can pause the video and go do that. And, and when you're done, you can also consult a cheat sheet that I've put together because obviously you're not here to share with each other as uh, participants in this. You're not here to share with me, but I put together a few ideas that I had in response to each. So at least you could get a sense of um, some potential outcomes. And some of the ideas that I've jotted down also are from previous participants. So it's not just me that you're hearing from, it's different voices as well. And you can see whether your approach was similar to those other approaches or if it was quite different. And there is no right or wrong answer. So that will be hopefully an interesting comparison. Now that you've had a chance to practice some real world application of the comms and marketing advice and thinking about uh, the different platforms and the different considerations of each, I would like to offer some advice for good practice. Now, normally at this point, it wouldn't be me talking. I would ask for participants to share their own advice from their own experience. But unfortunately, that's not really possible, given that this is both digital and asynchronous. And so what I'm going to do instead is share some advice that I've had from previous participants. So you can see that here. And I will note that at least some of these things are applicable to social media. And one of them certainly is specifically about social media. So thinking about trend, trends and including hashtags. And there isn't um, any of this slide set here that's really focused specifically on social media. And that is because it is a massive concept that's hard to cover all in one session. And it falls into the same category as what I was saying earlier about things that are um, really more appropriately dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis where you can really go into a lot of depth about a particular platform. But if you are interested in social media and would like to think more broadly about how you pick the right platform for you and how you juggle your personal and professional personas if you use them and how you kind of make your social media activities more streamlined and efficient, there is a whole extra video about social media for scholars and that will be posted after this session if you would like to go watch that and see if there is some more information in there that might be useful and that session also links to a folder where i have saved some infographics that talk more about specific advice for different types of platforms so that might be a good starting point for you the one key thing that i want to mention here and i'm just going to let you uh, read these which i'm sure you have by now already is the final point, which is the fact that you will get better the more you do stuff. Um, the images on the right of the slide are all taken from different formats in which I presented a single outreach uh, activity or set of information, if you like. So I wrote an article that I also turned into a video and did a public presentation on and 
uh, created a, a Flickr album for and blogged about and um, did, I did various things now. I'm having trouble remembering even though I'm looking at all of those uh, icons. The point is that when you do something, it's really efficient to reuse the material and, and try to put that thing in as many different places as you can. And as you go through the process of doing that, of adapting things for different audiences and different formats, and as you go through the process of doing um, a different type of thing for each format, so one video and now another video and now a podcast, you start to become much more comfortable and you start to develop some intuition about some techniques that will work for you. You'll get feedback from your audience. You'll have your own kind of internal barometer that gives you feedback and that will allow you to adjust course as you go. So I would suggest that really you just start. Don't worry about how good you are or how bad you are. Just start playing around and getting some experience and reflecting on how things go and trying to learn from that. And, and don't be scared off by the idea of it and, and by the fact that, you know, if you are communicating, you're putting something out into the world and you might embarrass yourself, you're not going to embarrass yourself. You know, someone is going to find it interesting or useful. Someone will give you great feedback and ultimately it will be a really good learning experience no matter what. So I would say don't be afraid, just dive right in. Now I'd like to end up by asking for you to share any advice that I might not have had on that last slide. And also, while you're at it, perhaps you could give me some information about what other scenarios might have been useful in the collection that I sent, whether you struggled with anything as you were thinking about those scenarios, what were the, the comms and marketing and outreach uh, and, and research communication questions that you were coming up with as you were trying to think through those and what other um, skills would you like to have. And also, perhaps you could discuss more about what you think makes good research comms. So that very first question that I asked you about a good research communication experience, maybe you can share some of your ideas from that as well. And I'd love to have your feedback so that I can incorporate all of those things either below this session, if I hear um, from enough of you, I can create something that captures all of your thoughts, but I can also feed this into future sessions face-to-face uh, -face and also online. So it would be great to have your feedback on additional issues and questions. And if you have other questions, then you're more than welcome to get in touch. In particular, a lot of advice, as I've said, is, is much easier to give when you're thinking about a specific project and specific needs of different people. So I'm happy to chat through particular areas if you'd like to have advice bespoke about a certain thing that you're doing or to link you up with someone who is, is more of an expert in those areas than I am, whether that's someone at Exeter, uh, at our institution, or elsewhere. So please do feel free to get in touch with questions or comments, and I'm happy to chat further.